Street. This is T4Y opening the doors of the Mystery Playhouse for Peter Laurie. Tonight we bring you a superior story of crime and punishment by Freeman Wills Croft. It's called The Level Crossing. Five years ago, Duncan Thwaite stole a thousand pounds from his firm and only one man knew it. And for five years, this man, John Dunn, had blackmailed Thwaite. This afternoon, when Dunn called on Thwaite for another payment, he didn't know that the other man had murder in his heart. Yes, Dunn? Yeah, I'm sorry to trouble you, Mr. Thwaite, here in your office. But I'm in difficulty again about Miss son. Your son? Yes, he's got into more trouble. And he must produce 500 quid or he'll get run in. I was wondering, Mr. Thwaite, if maybe you could help me. The devil with your son. Can you never say straight out what you want? Oh, straight as you like, Mr. Thwaite. Just 500 quid. It ain't much from one gentleman to another. 500 you wouldn't like the moon by any chance? Oh, come now, sir. To a gentleman like you, 500 is a mere nothing. You ain't surely going to make a difficulty over a trifle like that. You needn't think you're going to get it from me. A small sum I could manage, but not 500. 500, Mr. Thwaite. You wouldn't cheat a poor man out of his bit of money. Don't be a fool, Don. I paid you something like 3,000 the last five years, and I'm about fed up. Don't push me too far. Too far, Mr. Thwaite? Why, I wouldn't put you about. Not for the world, I wouldn't. I'd never have mentioned this trifle if I didn't know you could oblige with ease. Oh, I could oblige, could I? But since you know so much, just tell me how. Well, I, I wouldn't have presumed to suggest it, Mr. Thwaite. But since you asked me, sir, what about postponing the new house? Many a man would give his ears for a little place in the country. How did you know about that? Oh, nothing to it, sir. Everyone knows that Mrs. Thwaite's been looking over the old coming place, and it's not hard to guess why. <laughs> coming up in the world, aren't we? Going out to live there with all the toss, eh? Son, if you think that you can... Just a moment. Just a moment, there, sir. No use losing our tempers, is there now? No. No. No use in losing our temper. And I'm not in such a great hurry, sir. Tomorrow would do. I could call you at your office tomorrow, after hours. Uh, for the money, I mean. No, no. Not here. That's indiscreet. You come to my house, John. You come to my house tomorrow night. And we'll take care of the whole business. All right, sir. And, by the way, bring along those quotations of Maxwell. No harm to have a reason for your call. <laughs> Hey, Duncan, I went into Pember today and had another look at the Cummings place. It's a nice house, Duncan. I don't see why we shouldn't have it now. But, Hilda, darling, well, if you're I... really as hard up as you pretend, we could get it on the installment plan. Oh, I don't want to start that. That way you never know what you own or where you are. Oh, thank you, Jane. Just put the coffee down here. Cream and sugar, sir. I'll have it black tonight, then. It'd be better not to have it at all. Maybe then you wouldn't need those sleeping powders. It's only for my nerves, dear. That's all, then. Thank you, ma'am. And now, Duncan, about the house. You don't want it, perhaps, but what about me? What about my living in this shabby neighborhood? Before I married you, I always lived in a really fine place. Why, I'm ashamed to ask my friends here. I tell you, I feel it. What's more, I'm not going to stand it. I know. I know all about it, Peter. I know it should do, and you, you should have it in time, but, uh, we'll have to wait. Believe me, I, I haven't the money. I don't want to pry into your secrets, Duncan, but I'll tell you this. If you don't buy that house, I'll... Well, you could at least meet the first installment. Hilda. Yes? Hilda, why do we always have to do this, to talk like this? When we were first married... Duncan, we... I'd be most tactful. The perfect wife, really. I've never asked you about various rather considerable sums of money. Those expenses you have periodically... You know very well this has been going on for years. Oh, what's the use of talking about it? Uh, by the way, if this clerk of yours is coming here tomorrow evening, I shan't be home. I'll be using the car, so be sure to leave the keys. You must have them. I haven't. Yes, they're on the ring with the others. Uh, dear. 
Yes. About the house. I may have a plan. Would it make you feel happier if... Well, I mean, if I were able to turn up the money. And then... I mean, maybe things can be better with us, Hilda. Perhaps, Duncan, perhaps. <laughs> one never really knows, does one? <laughs> of everything. The things safe, safe as houses. Only a little care, an ugly ten minutes, and once more I'll be a free man. John Dunn must die. Oh, oh that, that's him. That must be him. Jane? Yes, sir? Jane, I, I expect that'll be Mr. Dunn. He was to stop by on business this evening. Yes, sir. Uh, show him into my study, Jane. And I won't be needing you anymore this evening. Unless I work late, I might drink for some coffee. I shan't be going out this evening. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. No. I haven't forgotten anything. I couldn't have forgotten anything. Oh, my watch. I almost forgot my watch. I've got to set it by the clock. Uh, there. I can't slip up now. I just don't let myself go into a funk. Mr. Dunn to see you, sir. Good evening, Dunn. Good evening, sir. Oh, it's those Maxwell quotations, I suppose. Yes. We'll do them at once. Get them out, son. Now I'll initial them. No use in taking half a precaution. You came here to get them dealt with. So we'll deal with them. Here they are, sir. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's right. Yes, done. That looks quite all right. I'll initial them just as they are. Yes. Going fine. They'll find these business papers on him. I say he came out to get them initialed. Good. Now that's out of the way. Now about the other matter. Time to the drink. We'll just have time to work. By the way, have a drink? Well, uh, No use in spoiling, even though we've got unpleasant business to do. Uh, no, thanks. I'm not taking nothing tonight. What are you afraid of? Think I'm going to poison you? Oh. Here. Take the decanter. Pour out the same for both of us. That's fine. Now, look here, Doc. There's not a bit of use in your talking about 500 pounds. I simply haven't got it. And that's all there is to it. I told you that already. All the same, I'm anxious to meet you. Uh, how would this do? This, see? <laughs> you always will have your little joke, Mr. Thwaite. Don't be a fool, Dunn. Take 50 and go away and be thankful. 500, Mr. Thwaite. My son, I mentioned But confound it, old man, haven't I told you I can't do it? If you don't believe me, look here. Look at my bank book. Balanced as of today. Look, look at the date. A book, Mr. Thwaite. Oh, you surprise me, sir. A man with your skill in juggling figures in books. Why, I seem to recall a little matter once... Go right ahead, old man. You're making my job easier for me. Go right ahead. The drink ought to be starting to work by now. Oh, I've, I've got to keep talking. Well, I've made you an offer. I tell you seriously, Don, if you don't take it, you'll get nothing. I'm going to end all this. And may I ask how? I'll sell this house and pay the money back with interest. I'll take my medicine, then I'll go abroad under a new name and start fresh. But your wife, sir. That, Don, is none of your business. You can leave her out of this. My wife will leave the country first, if you must know. She'll be waiting for me under the new name when I get out. Two or three years, can't be more. So you'd better take your 50. Later, I'll make it 300 a year. Oh, no. I think the drink's beginning to work. Only, well, what have I given him too much? I can't feel a thing. But then, I'm used to those internal sleeping powders. I have to work fast now. There's not much time left. Well, what about it? Will you take it or leave it? 500. 500, I want this to waste not a penny less. No. I didn't give him. Just about ready. Are you sure, Dunn? Are you quite sure this is your final decision? Uh, yes. Five hundred. All right. I'm through. Finished. Go and do your work. Oh. No, you haven't, Mr. Swayze. Not you, yes. You're not that much of a fool. Come on, pay up. Five hundred. Not feeling well? Have a drop more whiskey done. Yeah. It'll fix you up. 
Oh, won't it just so? Got to get moving now. I've got to be back here by time. Your train's due. I'll be in my study, in for Jane. She'll be able to establish the fact that I'm here. I'll reset the clock. Then I'll draw her attention to the time in some way. That's strange, that, Mr. Freighter. I did feel a bit giddy for a time, but I'm better now. Indigestion, I expect. Yes, I dare say. Well, if you're going on this train, it's time to start. Sleep on this business and let me know your decision tomorrow. Oh, here. Take the 50 in any case. Hmm? Here. Uh, all right. Uh, I say, uh, uh, your truck's fast. Uh, ten minutes. Yes. Oh, I don't think so. Uh, you must be slow. Uh, l- l- look at my watch uh, here. Uh, yes, I... I guess perhaps mine is... Look here, you're not quite fit yet. I'll see you to the station. Uh, don't take the trouble. Is trouble? Why, well, it's no trouble at all. There now. So we start. Mm-hmm. Mustn't forget to reset the clock. Then I'll ring for Jane directly. I'm back. Don't fall on that ugly face of yours yet. You'll know when it's time. The hammer. Yes, it's here in my coat pocket. There. That was quiet. Jane will never hear that. She'll never know I left the house. Oh, it's a perfect night. Black and pitch. What? Oh, no, no. That couldn't be the train, not yet. No. It's just a freak. Maybe one of those will come through sooner. Well, so much the better. So oh, infernally black. I wish my heart wouldn't pound this place. But I guess it's only natural. But I've got to keep control. It'll all be over soon. Then I can be free. I'm all ready. I've got everything. I thought of everything. The hammer's right here in my pocket. One quick blow. Then put him on the track. Just beyond the level crossing. Just a few more steps. All right now. I'll let him get a few paces ahead of me. There. The hammer. Bring it up slowly, quietly. And then one quick blow it. Oh, no. Oh, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's all gone wrong. There's one thing I've overlooked. Just one thing. Done. I dare say you'll be all right. Now, done. I'll be turning back now. Yes. Yes. You've got plenty of time. Good night, Dan. Good night, sir. See you tomorrow, sir. Oh, it's you, sir. Thank you, Jane. I went to see Mr. Dunn, the train. Will there be anything more, sir? Coffee, perhaps? No. I guess I'll just go off to bed now. You can close up. I've had a rather tiring day. Good night, sir. I... I didn't do it. I, I'm not a murderer. Oh, I must have been crazy. I've had to live all my life remembering, afraid of my own dream, afraid of myself. Oh, nothing, nothing could be that bad. Nothing that can happen to me now could be that bad. At the last moment, I was saved. I, I'm saved. I didn't do it. I'm not a murderer after all. I'm not a Good 
morning, sir. Good morning, Jane. Good morning, Duncan. Hilda, up so early. I decided to come down for breakfast. Duncan, we must have another set of teas made. It's so awkward having to ask you whenever I want to use the car. Here you are. Thank you. Here's your tea, sir. And your egg will be ready directly. Thank you, Jane. Mmm, it's a fine morning. I must say you're very cheerful today. I am. I had a wonderful night's sleep. I didn't even hear you come in, dear. Oh, yes, I feel fine. But, Mr. Swaite, have you heard the news? News? What news? The milkman just told me. Oh, they do say he was cut up something terrible. They found him down by the crossing this morning, sir. Who was it, Jane? Mr. Dunn, sir. Ran over by a train at the crossing, he was. <laughs> After hearing the momentous and not altogether unwelcome news that the man who had been blackmailing him had met with a fatal accident at the railroad crossing, Duncan Thwaites hurried down to the scene of the tragedy. The body was already moved, and the police were in charge. Sergeant saluted as Thwaites appeared. Sad affair this, Mr. Thwaites. Oh, you knew the old gentleman, didn't you, sir? Knew him. Of course I knew him. Why, he was with me last evening going into some business. It must have been when he was leaving me that this happened. It's awful. I, it's given me quite a shock. Oh, accidents will happen. Yes, I, I know, Sergeant, but I feel a bit responsible about it. John had had to drop too much, and I thought it wise to come out to see him save the station. The cold air seems to make him all right. So I turned back before we reached the coffin. I see, I see. Well, there'll probably be an inquiry, sir. Inquiry? Uh, routine, of course, sir. Oh, yes, of course. Purely routine. Naturally. Purely routine. The defense may continue... May it please your lordship, I should like to point out to this court and the gentlemen of the jury one last and very vital fact. My client, Mr. Duncan Swate, went quite openly to the railroad crossing with the late Mr. Dunn. Mr. Swate made no attempt to conceal that action either from his servant or the following morning from the police. A murderer gentleman does not openly admit, nay, advertise his presence at the scene of a crime... It's clear, then, that this was no crime. This regrettable tragedy was an accident, pure and simple. Crown's witness, the Lord. The Crown may proceed. <laughs> My Lord and gentlemen of the jury, we have heard the testimony of the accused in which he describes his actions on that fatal night. The Crown wishes to go on record, here and now, in this respect. The accused testimony, we are prepared to accept word for word as the truth. <laughs> however, however, the Crown is not prepared to accept Mr. Fleet's account of his actions that night as the whole truth. There were, in fact, other actions of which the accused has not seen fit to inform you. The Crown is prepared to prove and will prove that this man is a cold and calculating murderer. The Crown is prepared to document each detail of this monstrous crime with incontrovertible evidence. Let us then consider, point by point, the evidence which proves that Duncan Sweet made preparations to murder John Dunn, had the motive to murder John Dunn, and did, in fact, murder the late John Dunn. First, the post-mortem examination proves that John Dunn was drugged by sleeping powders similar to those in possession of the accused. Second. Yes, I, I did notice the clock in the study just before dinner. It was correct then, sir. 
But when I showed Mr. Dunn in, it was ten minutes past. Sir, this paper found among the effects of the deceased was left in a sealed envelope and refers in detail to certain fake ledger entries made by the accused some five years ago. Both on various occasions, withdrawals of considerable sums from the bank account of Mr. Duncan Sweet were followed by the deposit of identical sums into the account of the late Mr. John Dunn. Fifth. The engine wheels was covered with it, Governor. That's it all over they was with blood. And six, the hammer bearing fake fingerprints found in the pocket of the coat he wore that night. Gentlemen of the jury, the crown rests. I ask you to bring in the verdict of guilty of premeditated murder. In the face of the evidence, you cannot do otherwise. <laughs> in the hope of bringing some comfort to you. God's mercy is infinite, even on this last morning. Yes, Chaplain. Is there something you wish to tell me, my son? No one would believe. No one could believe. I... I did plan to murder him. I had no choice. I had to put an end to his blackmail and a face losing my wife. So I trotted out to the station that night with John Dunn and murder in my heart. But, but I turned back. Whatever they say, I turned back. Guilty as I am in my heart, my hands are guiltless of that man's blood. I swear it. It was an accident. He, he, he must have grown dizzy and stumbled over the tracks. Yes, I, I was ready and eager to kill him. Everything was planned, but something happened, something that made Dunn safe that night. And it suddenly dawned on me as I neared the tracks that I made a fatal error. I could not go through with a murder. You see, if I could have entered the house without attracting attention and reset the clock, my maid would have certainly testified that I was in the house at the time of John Dunn's death. But you see, I couldn't get into the house because my wife had taken the key. by Freeman Wills Croft. Now, I know you'll agree with me that Mr. Croft can weave a story as ingeniously as the best of them. But it's time once again to close the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. This is T4Y saying good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.